terracotta army. Perhaps the most familiar image in Chinese history for the majority of Americans. 7,500 life-size terracotta statues, each constructed separately, each with a separate mold, all built to, guard, to glorify and also to guard the spirit of one man, Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor of China, a man who revolutionized his country and thus affected the whole history of Asia and the world. Who was Qin Shi Huangdi? He was a product of the era of the Warring States. He was perhaps China's greatest warrior emperor, a conqueror before anything else, and a man who not only unified China politically, but also changed China's culture. The Emperor Qin was responsible for standardized a China, standardized Chinese alphabet for a system of laws that did outlast his death and outlast his dynasty. And the imperial idea, the idea that China will be ruled from the center by officers of the emperor appointed from the capital. He thus was not only a unifier of the seven warring states, he was also a unifier of the Chinese people, marginalizing the nobility and putting everyone under the control of a central government. The picture of Qin Shi Huangdi is interesting because although he is carrying a sword and he is the warrior emperor par excellence and he is a man who breaks with Chinese tradition, you'll see that he's not able to quite overcome Chinese anti-militarism. You never see him, although he conquered as much territory, perhaps, as Julius Caesar, you never see him in armor. You never see a Chinese emperor in armor. He's always in the traditional scholar's robes, the only concession being his sword. For 250 years, China was divided into seven warring states. The old empire, the Zhao, had collapsed in the 700s. There had been a period of anarchy after this. But then you would see reconsolidation. And when the Emperor Qin, the, the Qin Emperor, is born in 259, his state is only one of seven. His state is only one of seven. And again, he is the product of a period of extended civil war. Very directly a product, because part of his childhood was spent as a hostage from the Qin state in the state of Zhao. And his experience as a hostage were very negative. Um, he possibly suffered physical abuse, and when he returned, when um, the hostages returned from each country, he had a burning hatred of Zhao, and also a belief in no political compromises. He didn't believe in truces and short pieces. He had an absolutist vision, and again, it was perhaps molded by his experiences as a hostage in Zhao. All right. The Quinn have one advantage, and it's, it's pronounced either Quinn, usually pronounced Chin, although spelt Quinn, in their struggle with the other states. And this was geographical. They are the westernmost of the Chinese states. For this reason, they share a border with the steppes and with the steppe peoples, specifically with the Hongnu, a nomadic co coalition of tribes, constantly at war with the Chinese, possibly a people who would reemerge after further nomadic travelings in the West 600 years later as the Hun. The Qin learned from the Hongnu the value of one particular West weapon system, cavalry, cavalry, cavalry. Um, most of the other Chinese armies still were centered on the chariot. The Qin learned the hard way that horse cavalry can ride circles around chariots, and since they're East Asian cavalry, they're going to be firing arrows into the chariots all the times they're riding around them. So the Qin built their army around cavalry, while the armies of the other six states, who did not have this experience of constant warfare with the Hongnu, remained chariot-based, remained chariot-based. It was at least partly this that allowed 
the Qin to ultimately conquer the other six states by the year 221 and establish their own universal dynasty and establish their own universal dynasty. The importance of the Qin cavalrymen are shown among the terracotta soldiers. Um, at least 200 um, cavalrymen and horses are included in the 7,500 um, terracotta warriors in Xi'an. Here are the uh, images of the terracotta soldiers as they, as they were in life. Um, these are real Quinn soldiers. Again, a mounted archer, an officer with a ceremonial mace used by all Chinese armies, and the most familiar picture from the terracotta, uh, of the terracotta soldiers, um, an infantryman wearing not iron or bronze armor, but leather armor. Iron armor was reserved for officers. Um, the Qin did have some distinctive weapons, this long sword, and the crossbow, a Chinese invention from the Qin period. A very light crossbow, a crossbow that could be fired very rapidly and was the sidearm both of infantry and cavalry. It was believed by historians for some time that the Qin's other advantage was iron, that the Qin armies had iron armor and iron weapons that the other six dynastic armies did not have. Um, Archaeological, uh, uh, archaeological discoveries recently have shown that the Qin did not have any lead over the other states as far as the use of iron weapons are concerned. Their advantages were more in their tactics and in their organization. You'll see one extraordinary fact of this organization. These are triggers from the crossbows. They're standardized. 2,000 years before Eli Whitney and, Sp and the Springfield Armory, um, the Qin were using interchangeable parts in their crossbows. You could replace one trigger with another. An extraordinary achievement and a triumph of Chinese organization. Again, 2,000 years before the first American assembly line. Other remarkable achievements of the Qin. The Great Wall. The Qin Emperor did not build the entire Great Wall. Um, what we see today in the Great Wall, especially these um, blockhouse fortifications, were actually built by the Ming in the 1400s. But the Qin Emperor did build 4,000 miles of wall, or at least connected 4,000 miles of wall, creating a solid barrier against the Hongnu and the other steppe tribes at the cost of perhaps 100,000 lives of Chinese workers um, during the 10 years that um, were spent by the Qin in constructing the wall. In addition, a system of canals and the best system of roads ever seen in China were constructed by the Qin, you, by the Qin using corvi labor, using forced labor, using forced labor. The Qin Emperor's dream was to unite all of China in a single polity, eliminate all memory of the warring states, a standardized alphabet, a standardized system of law, and easy travel between the regions. And the canal system and the road system were part of this.